I'm sorry to start. <clears throat> so since everybody's coming, we've got Scott, Scott Shia from Remote Central Laboratory at Andrews, at Joint Base Andrews. Yeah. Um, he's going to talk to today about our emergency response science at the RSL. Uh, Scott did his PhD at Michigan State, did a postdoc uh, here at LBL and UC Berkeley, and then moved to RSL where he's been for four years now. Yeah, about yeah. Thanks, Tenzing. Uh, it's nice to be back. The Bay Area is always wonderful. This is a pleasant respite from the weather over in DC. It's actually been pretty mild this winter, but it's not like this. It's really nice to be back in the Bay Area. Uh, if you have any questions along the way, just stop. I'll happily answer them. Uh, I'm going to talk about kind of a general overview of radiological nuclear emergency response science. We'll be focused on what we do at RSL, which stands for Remote Sensing Lab. We'll talk a little bit about who we are and what we do. Um, and you'll, you'll probably, you may get confused along the way about what all the different agencies and assets are. You know, I've got a variety of logos down here. At RSL, we wear too many hats and do too many different things, but don't get too worried about it, just more focus on the science and the interesting things. And if you have any specific questions, I'm happy to answer them. I'll be here today and then all day tomorrow as well. So if anyone wants to talk to me about whatever, I'd be happy to answer. And I should mention back here in the corner, Joseph Cope, he's here with me, one of my colleagues. He also works at RSL. So, uh, you don't want to bug me, you can bug him too. But he's pretty new, so I'll handle the questions that he can't. <laughs> um, so I think I talked here to give the overview. I talked about this a little bit. I'll talk about the different aspects of the things we do. Um, you can kind of break it up into different areas. Um, maybe I should advance to the uh, couple slides to present that, but just and then rewind a tiny bit. I'll talk kind of about what things we do in the areas of crisis, crisis response and consequence management, which crisis response would be before anything goes wrong, when you're doing nuclear search, you're looking for a source, or you're just monitoring, you're looking for a source, or you could even almost lump in kind of just preventative radiation detection, or then consequence management, which is with which something's been distributed in the environment and then what you do to measure that. So, but I'll talk most specifically about a few of the different areas that RSL has a big piece and I serve on these sort of response teams. Nuclear search program. So these are the sort of the search you're probably thinking about where looking for radiation sources in the environment that probably aren't supposed to be there. Um, and then, if you're looking then more in the CM world and consequence management, the FERMAC or Federal Radiological Monitoring Assessment Center, and then aerial measuring system, which kind of plays in both of these worlds where we have radiation sensors on aerial platforms. I'll talk about how all these are interrelated to each other and where RSL fits in and kind of what technologies we're using in these different areas. So this is kind of a rough, you know, overview wheel spoke of the different uh, response assets that NA84 or NNSA has for emergency or nuclear um, emergency and just response. There are a whole lot of different acronyms on here, and uh, some of these terms change a lot. People decide to reorg and change the names of things, but the general picture of them stays about the same. So here we have on the kind of on this side the more the assets are more related to crisis response. So joint technical operations team or the accident response group. These are groups uh, generally with uh, looking at nuclear weapons and accidents and incidents with them, but uh, 
you know, rendering those safe and making sure they don't uh, op they don't go off or you know they don't release radioactivity in a way that they shouldn't. So here we have, and then in the middle we have some some programs that kind of can go between consequence management or crisis response. They kind of do different roles. I'll talk about these because we sort of fit in here <laughs> and at, at uh, RSL. So this is one that I serve on nuclear search program. Uh, we do a lot of uh, work in in search, so putting detectors in mobile systems and vehicles or having ground on the ground and backpack type systems. I'll show you some of the different ones that we feel in the way we do operations a little bit. Then similarly, uh, local, uh, more local response groups would fall under the radiological assistance program. So a regionalized one that is the national atmospheric release advisory and they so they do weather so based on weather uh, transporting material through the environments modeling that you've maybe seen some plots um, so FERMAP is really a coordinating coordinating agency between a lot of different assets I'll talk about that more later reacts which I won't talk about really at all they're concerned with training and sort of medical consulting for radiation releases or you know internal if there is an issues or modeling dose assessment for internal radiation they're really medical expertise and then aerial measuring system i'm a big we're at andrews rsl remote sensing lab do a lot with aerial measuring i'll talk quite a bit about that um well, so yeah, so I kind of said that I'll focus in on these different areas here. Um, We have a sister site out at RSL Nellis, that's uh, Nellis Air Force Base, which is near Las Vegas. Historically, that's, uh, it's located there due to the, uh, the, the National Nuclear Security Site, or formerly the Nevada Test Site, where previously they did the testing of uh, nuclear weapons. And uh, RSL Nellis, uh, existed there and then basically RSL Andrews uh, was started to have a presence uh, near the nation's capital. To give a, an idea of sort of our workforce at Andrews and you know specifically what we do in the response that we have there, um, you know th this graphic here uh, it's a little old so it might not be exactly right but gives you a rough idea of who we are. I counted that we have about 50 people right now, and that's, you know, some, you know, about 10, 11 of those PhDs, some of them masks, and then, you know, similar, or maybe a little bit less, but people with masters, and we're mostly, and we're made up of scientists and engineers, but then also some technical sort of operation support, and we have pilots and people who, the people who make our operations happen, but we need other than the scientists. And so we're kind of a diverse organization where we come from diverse uh, backgrounds, but that's all to support doing the operations you'll see here in just a minute. So first I want, I'll talk about the nuclear search program, NSP. For those in the audience who are somewhat familiar, this uh, used to go under the acronym NRAC. Um, we've recently, rebranded and now NSP has several several response teams under them. Mostly I'll be talking about uh, the things that I refer to would typically fall under something called the uh,
national search does the, the search, but you don't need to worry about these acronyms too much. This sort of lays out really what, what NSP does, it's kind of mission goals, um, advanced search, by this I mean nuclear, radi radiological search. This can be um, various functions. It could be tactical where we're supporting law enforcement, looking for specific, specific source of interest, or it could be in more of a preventative mode, um, partnering with law enforcement for major public events such as inauguration or 4th of July support, some major event where we're um, folding into bigger law enforcement operation, perform, providing rad expertise and fielding detectors for radiation security. Um, in certain scenarios, um, in a response, we would we can will serve an advisory role to senior DOE uh, federal response officers who um, who would be in charge of being basically sort of high up in lead DOE uh, a response official. We can provide basically them with technical support, technical expertise to advise them. On, on the response. So that's what I mean by all purpose uh, advisory support. I talked about the PRD, that's sort of similar to search. And then we, all, we participate in a lot of exercises, you know, making sure that we're on our toes. And we also provide training for a lot of uh, other agencies. There are a lot of people who feel radiation detectors with. Um, various levels of support, you know, from the local policeman just wearing a pager or civil support team, different response, you know, different law enforcement type agencies. I will provide them with training with how to use their equipment and can be um, follow on to those, those people during a, some kind of event or just providing them with training and expertise on how to use equipment. We wear, like I said, we wear a lot of different hats. So this is a hodgepodge of various detectors that we use. We put out in the field and, um, you know, wide range of different systems here. So when we're do so one of our types of operations is uh, we'll do a lot of different mobile, mo when I say mobile systems, I usually mean a vehicle. So we install different types of detectors in uh, some kind of vehicle driving around sort of city neighborhood type scales. This, I've shown a whole bunch of detectors shoved into a vehicle. Um, it's not necessarily that chaotic every time, but it's just there to show you kind of the different, we have a lot of different possibilities and different configurations that we can do. And I'll show on another slide, but here, this is another detector. Sometimes we might conceal it and be doing low visibility, something that's, you know, we don't want to draw very much attention or as little as possible, but sometimes that's not an issue. And we sort of put big systems in as much detector volume as you can get to an extent. So here then, this would be a system, this is a, this we put inside of a backpack. Uh, these, this is what we refer to as our Gemini detectors, but they're, um, so here this is crystal here of sodium iodide, so gamma detection, scintillator, and then with uh, helium-3 neutron detection. So these are, this is sort of a workhorse for ground-based, uh, by ground, I mean foot, uh, pedestrian detection system that uh, you use. Uh, here it's paired, so the phone, or sorry, the detectors will be paired via Bluetooth to a, to a cell phone, and that's basically how we look at the data from the backpack. And then the system, all, almost all of our systems are workhorses to, uh, to lend to the data from our detector <laughs> systems in the field to a server central database by cellular data so that other teams uh, 
home teams, if you will, people in an operation center can also be monitoring the data that gets sent via the cellular. Um, they can monitor the data uh, in real time, just as the person in the field. So we'll have further reach back support for providing more involved analyses or looking at the data and adjudicating alarms um, in a way um, to give support to the field teams. So here, on the, these are just down here, radiation, uh, handheld or pager, um, very relatively simple, if you will, type systems. They don't necessarily give you any spectral information, but these are pager type systems that a police officer, firefighter, somebody might carry. And uh, really just meant is alarming systems. In, uh, we also employ typically as secondary or follow-on detectors if, you, if we have an alarm, which I'll talk about what I mean by alarm in a second. In one of these systems, we might follow on to get a better identification with a wide range, wide range of high purity germanium detectors. These are very, I mean, most of you are familiar, going to be familiar, obviously a workhorse in terms of quality, in terms of detector resolution. And we use that to provide um, a more fine identification if that's something that we need and bring on and, and set and maybe 12. Um, for some time being, but basically used for identification rather than, uh, you know, the sort of gross first uh, search. And then we have some more. So here, these are just neutron drop sensors. They're just dwell. And they have some specific applications, but I won't really get into that. So the backpack yes. system, the GPS, so it's take it from the, from the phone. The GPS uh, tracking, which is probably used, right? Yeah, so in these, yeah, it does. So the, this actually has a GPS too, but we use the GPS, yeah, from the phone for these systems, yeah. Um, they all of our, so I didn't really mention necessarily specifically when we do, so we also have uh, GPS systems with. Our, all of our mobile vehicle installs as well. We typically use, uh, so these ones I showed here are more of our in-house built detectors, kind of older ones, but we also very commonly use RSI detectors. So like uh, basically the same detectors that we have on our uh, AMS, on our helicopter, or our fixed wing aircraft, we'll put them in the vehicles too. And they've got, uh, a GPS receiver, so we'll be tracking the vehicles as they're out in the field. To... I mean, sure, it looks like the car is normally used for something else. It just if you have a mission, you actually just put it. In. That's yeah. right. So usually we'll be. So uh, I don't know this. So this one was prop. This one looks like it was probably during an exercise, and we're kind of sending uh, just a whole bunch of stuff out there, and it. Depending on depending what ends up happening, they might deploy with you know they might take this this bag out and just set it there, and the or, or they might reconfigure this and throw it in a trash bag and just throw the trash bag in like a trash can or something and have it sitting there and just be like a static. Did we we've done that before? Like throw it in dumpsters or on the side of, side of the road or something. So it's like a static system that you're just kind of monitoring. Um, so sometimes we'll, so like here it's kind of just configured in a way, to, like however we might want to use it. It's not set up for something specific. Usually when we operate though during like a preventative case, uh, you know, with local law enforcement, we'll set it up in, in a way that we have um, basically on both the passenger and the driver side, on the outsides, we'll put uh, a gamma detector, sodium iodide, and then. So that's really more for transport, right? This is not really operational. It's no, special. this isn't really an operational one. Yeah. A little, yeah, it's a little more uh, sophisticated. Yeah, so, right. right. Yeah, this is just to kind of show all the different systems. Because if you see there, there's an HPGE there. It's kind of just a variety. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's how you get to go to places. So yeah. Um, so usually we would set it up so that you have a sodium iodide detector basically facing out on each side and then inside of that 
you have the helium three, and that's just we put the sodium iodide on the outside so it's more sensitive. You're not logging it. But um, so do you have visual cameras there too? So we not so we don't in these in our typical mobile systems. We will sometimes put scientists in the MERS systems though. That's your visual system. Um, the extra person. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, MERS has some, yeah, so sure. some, um, and they'll be using that. So sometimes, like, we'll put basically an RSL scientist in there to be more of a adjudication and expert in there during the operation than like the FBI might have. Are um, you getting MERS systems? So did you mention that work? So we have one. So I don't know if we own the system per se or not, but we. We work with them, so during our work with, uh, you know, the the uh, Washington field office who owns that, who has the MERS system, will basically, so we'll field uh, mobile systems just like this that don't have, well, not configured like that, but sort of all of our equipment and all of our people, but then we'll also sometimes just put an RSL scientist into MERS and be the subject, med, subject matter expert to look at the data that's coming into mm -hmm. MERS as it's doing its operations. One final, at least for me. So uh -huh. what happens when you go indoors in the stadium or indoors with GPS? So How do you track the system indoors so you don't have GPS? Only fast. Oh, you don't have that. Okay. Uh, you well, let me, I'll just show it right now because it's a so the, the way we so one way we can so the so there's a couple so the basic way we would do it is so the simplest way we would do it is just look at it on the phone and you're just searching and you don't use any map you're just looking at like you know handheld you're just looking at strip charts of gross counts and spectra and that sort of thing it's not really visualized on any map. Um, however, we can operate in a mode where we basically map the data onto a floor plan. So here, th this is what we call pad mapping. We can use this a way to basically give you map data in a GPS denied or irrelevant type environment. So the way it's pretty simple, we just load, basically load in some kind of map of building floor plan. It can be any image, it doesn't matter, just um, an image and you, in the sort of concept of operations is you imagine like starting up here, walking in a straight line, you know, down to another point, you just mark those point, your start and your stop, you mark a straight path and it assumes you're going at a constant rate, drops it down on the map and you know, Basically, each one of these points has an associated spectrum with it, and you know, just it's just mapping the gross count data on this. But you have all the spectral or any alarm data that you would want to. But it basically, um, you, assuming a constant walking pace, it drops it down onto the base image that you load into there. It's it's pretty simple, but that's um, that's really the only fielded system we have for uh, mapping in a GPS deny environment. There's some other things that people have played around with a little bit, but this is um, this is the only one like that. Sometimes um, if it's more dedicated, like specific spots we're interested, we'll use a detector like this. So these are specific neutron detectors. But also, like a backpack, you might basically just drop them and do a systematic series of twelves, which is something we do, like in specific environments sometimes. But um, that I mean, that's really slow and laborious. Uh, depends what a little bit what you're doing. Sometimes, if we were walking around a stadium or a building, though. You wouldn't even necessarily produce a map. We would just look at the data. 
Um, so this is some of the consequence management, more relevant uh, instrumentation. Not going to spend too long on it, but we do uh, we bring this um, into the field a lot of the time in case we would move into a scenario where we need to be concerned about contamination or health physics. So oftentimes we'll carry uh, health physics equipment with us, alpha and beta radiation probes or um, detectors calibrated for dose rate. We don't necessarily typically use them during our operations, but should we need to move into a more consequence management type posture, uh, we have them with us. Um, so here, so here, a few pictures to give a you know visual representation of what we do. I kind of mentioned some of this. So I've been a part of most of these operations. So here, so this is from a past State of the Union address. This picture showing up kind of everywhere, but this kind of represents how our science scientists operate in our mobile vehicle systems. We have the detectors looking out and the scientist has a laptop pulled of the laptop sitting on the lap looking at the data from the vehicle. Um, so we have, I'll show what it looks like a little bit better, but maps in front of us and spectral data and strip charts of alarms and count rates so we can make any uh, adjudications in the, in the field if we need to. So this is an example of like carrying a backpack system into a particular location. This was in support of the uh, George Bush funeral. So that's the National Cathedral. Uh, you know, about to carry it in to do a sort of foot survey of the space in the cathedral. Sometimes too, we'll even put detectors in other places. This was in support of 4th of July. We had map basically a mobile system but installed on a boat instead of a car and monitoring the boats uh you know the people take out for watching the fireworks and then as i mentioned we'll usually have people for these major events we'll have kind of an operation center where people are looking at the data that's taken in the field but it's kind of in a, where they have maybe a bigger picture of all the data that's coming in and this is a picture just of our sort of radiological operations center, if you will. During these major events, law enforcement has their own massive operation centers that there will be, you know, different people from lots of different agencies, law enforcement agencies being part of it. And we'll often send representatives there, but just sort of for a liaison coordination point of view so that we have a bigger picture of the operation that's going on. These events are, you know, in terms of the whole whole operation, it's quite complicated. And there's a lot of different pieces doing things, law enforcement things that have nothing to do with radiation detection. We're just a small piece of the overall part. But so they have, we'll have, we'll often put people in these different operation centers so that we, in the event that something is happening, we have an operational picture and are aware of that and can communicate it to our teams as needed. Can you comment on any like particularly interesting sort of communications that you've been involved with and how it kind of works within the system of law enforcement? Yeah, so I can talk about, yeah, so by far the most common thing that happens is we just chase down people who have had medical yeah. operations. And by chase down, I mean we don't chase down. Like, you know, we see them. So driving, you know, we'll be driving in the car and stopped at an intersection and somebody will drive by or walk by that's had technetium 99 or iodine 131, common medical isotopes. And we'll see that. And, um, Usually our systems will give kind of like an automatic I so we have some gadras and I mean we have and scrad configured and some gadras spectral identification to sort of give us some 
automatic identification capabilities, but our scientists in the vehicle or in the operation center will interrogate the spectra and um, we have sort of uh, systems that we, so if, if basically, if the, if our, if the alarm metric um, is high enough if it, to, to trigger, we, they, if it's a high enough threshold, that qualifies as something we that we that we need to adjudicate and attribute it to um, a cause that may just be as simple as saying, oh, it's elevated, naturally occurring radioactivity, or it might be that it's a medical or an industrial source. But basically, um, scientists interrogate it and adjudicate that. So. Another thing that is not quite as common, but it's fairly common, we'll see industrial gauges, uh, uh, density soil gauges, logging gauges, that sort of thing out in the field. Um, fairly commonly, it's not nearly as common as medical sources. But so you do sometimes run into like a, you'll see something like cesium or, or neutrons sometimes too from those. Um, in, in in those cases, uh, the whatever construction company or whatever is, uh, you know, will have paperwork and they'll provide it. But it's really uh, so we just sort of do the detection and we would adjudicate it as such. But it's up to our law enforcement partners to do whatever in or interaction with the other parties that uh, might that might happen. Um, I've had some one of the more interesting cases for me specifically I had is we were doing we were doing an exercise where uh, we were basically following somebody in the exercise we were following somebody who had a um, trying to follow someone who had a radiation source, you know, they were driving around a source they weren't supposed to. And um, so we were, we were basically just, so other people were doing certain detection, but we were basically just waiting at a, at a gas station to pull out and we were going to wait for them to pass by. But we actually, in, so in, in, they either were, or as part of the exercise, they were either were either had or did not have a radioactive source. But as we were pulling out, we encountered a real world uh, gauge, like uh -huh. as we were pulling. So it's almost like happening simultaneously. So like during the exercise, we find a real world source, and sometimes that happens, and it'll throw a little, uh, you know, little sidetrack into the things that you're not expecting and that happened during another and this wasn't me but one of my colleagues was telling me that he was involved in one and like you know they're doing their thing and with the law enforcement they basically like 
run into a robbery taking place or what so a lot of times the if you will the more interesting things that might happen don't necessarily have to do with the uh with the radiation detection by far um it's like just more to sometimes working with the law enforcement and what happens in the real world i haven't been part of anything where we found any um too exotic of a source or anything sometimes you'll have interesting cases where things present themselves if you're parked um you you can see uh like an x-ray source is kind of interesting you'll actually see a pulsed source of radiation come in so basically you can see the the CT scanner, the x-ray scanner, whatever, turn on and turn off in a pulse. That's a lot different than, you know, driving past a different radiation source. And depending how you encounter these things, they can look, they can look odd in the operational environment. It's not necessarily always the easiest to identify, but it tends to always come back to the same types of sources like an industrial gauge, something, something medically relevant, or, or just uh, some kind of naturally occurring or technically enhanced, naturally, technically enhanced radioactive material. And these are more, so I mentioned we do uh, low profile operations. So sometimes we'll, I mentioned this sort of, you know, just some more examples of us employing these in, in creative or interesting ways. Um, you know, we sometimes throw the detectors into coolers. You can then, you know, have set up or into a, a, a bag that you might be rolling around a hotel or wherever, you know, someplace that you might have luggage or putting them into traffic barrels and road cones. You know, it's funny during me sometimes it's like, you know, oh, thinking about this, it's like you create, you know, almost how it's all about operations and how to make it, you know, part of the real world. Like in these things, we much rather if like, you know, go go steal the road cone off the side of the road than go buy one from Home Depot or something. So it's, it's beat up and been run over by a truck a couple times or whatever. Uh, so, but we, you know, we configure, our sensors are, all, many of them are intentionally kind of very robust and configurable. So we can daisy chain detectors together. So we can use them in different configurations to suit whatever application that we might need. So this is, this is uh, what, so if, if is a scientist sitting in a vehicle, this is typically the type of data that I'm looking at. These are the, um, you know, this is kind of what it looks like on the computer as I'm sitting in a vehicle or, or on an, um, an airplane or helicopter looking at the radiation data. It, it might look a little different, specific, depending what you're doing, but this is kind of um, our operating picture. So here it's, you know, a situation roughly where we drove around this block. Um, so all, usually our systems, as I mentioned before, have GPS data, and that will be uh, put onto the map, drops it, you know, the GPS point every, every second, and basically accumulates a second of gain, and you can look at each of those individual seconds spatially. We can, basically, we can look at the data spatially, we can select regions on the map and look at just those regions, the spectra for it. We also look at uh, strip charts, time series data of different metrics, most simple being gross counts, but we look at various different alarm metrics that are either just based on gross counts or based on spectral data. Um, it can be gamma or neutron, depending uh, which, what you're concerned about. More often it's gamma, but then on these we can also interrogate different time portions 
of the uh, of the strip chart of these time series data and look at the spectra for that. So like here, when it shows up here, it's to illustrate, you know, times where you drive past where, you, you know, the, where it's red here is what we would consider an alarm. Now we can highlight that data and look at spectra and then adjudicate it based on um, the scientists we have and the tools we, in various identification tools we have for uh, uh, I, you know, identifying isotopes of concern, what have you, and then this this is just uh, further illustrating uh, same concept. So I'm just kind of zooming in to show it, you know, on a on a uh, finer detail. So here, this is this is in Washington to D.C. One of the traffic circles. Uh, these it uh, it's showing. Uh, we're in system alarmed, and then we can select just that data. Um, you know, I think in here, I think it's this time here and here. We can select that, just that piece of data, yeah, and look at, uh, you know, what, look at the spectra here. So here, this is for a, this is for a Tech 99 uh, medical data after a Tech 99 medical procedure. So that's, you know, that's sort of like what a common spectra for adjudication would look like. You might sometimes have a more or less obvious spectral signature. We make, that's how, that's usually how we interrogate the data. And now we, we have some tools too that we can basically, what the scientist is looking at the vehicle or the operator the operate or what the uh, you know follow on the operation center is looking at we can basically share what we're looking at each of us with the other people so we can talk with one another and uh, go through what we're seeing in those spectra to make sure we're all on the same page in terms of adjudication and a lot of times in these major operations a big part of that is you know even just you know it sort of you're sort of used to as a scientist just talking amongst each other and saying all these different things. But a lot of times in the field, it's about, you know, just keeping up between us. You don't, uh, sometimes during these, the uh, other partners can get, you know, spun off if they hear words like uranium or plutonium or something thrown around, you know, oh, is this this or that? Like, they're always like, oh, what did you see? Or if they hear, you know, we'll have, um, audio kind of, you know, to tell us when there's alarms too. They're, oh, what was that? What was that? You know, and to keep them reassured and, you know, we're ba we basically uh, give them a clear picture about what we're seeing in terms of it being a common medical procedure source or, um, no, that was just, that's just elevated background. And I, I talked about this before, um, based on Kai's question, but this is one other sort of uh, specialized tool we have if we're doing particularly indoor radiation mapping. Uh, you know, and here this is just during a measurement campaign. We're walking through a building and localizing point sources and then this shows all the paths that were different walk, walk, just heat map of gross counts. And this is just another uh, visualization of the same data where we're spatially interpolating between the uh, points that we actually took there. But uh, another way we can do at least simple mapping when GPS isn't isn't available. And then that's, a, so that kind of transitions into why I'm here right now collaborating uh, with Tenzing. We're, um, so this is a relic, so the GG, which is a Compton imager, Jaji, 
pronouncing it here. We're in the world where everything is ja, ja for germanium here. We make it into a more, I don't know, real sounding word, if you will, I guess, G -G. Um, But anyway, uh, this is a relatively uh, new technology in our, in, in, in my world, the sort of fielded radiation operation space. Um, we've sort of done, we've started using this um, operationally in limited situations in illustrating its um, use cases um, for locating sources um, spatially and you're just sort of, you know, painting the basic picture, visually showing you where radiation source in the world and giving you an identification of a particular isotope on the map. So collaborating on a project to implement, uh, I'll show it a little, couple of slides, but uh, some of the lamp uh, 3D scene fusion uh, technology that you're the experts on here um, with the GG to implement that in a feelable way for us doing operations. But here this just shows um, limited basic way that we, we've started to use gamma ray imaging. So these here are all examples of basically uh, detection and localization from standoff. So doing kind of a long 12 from a distance away um, and identifying the source. This could be, you know, you might imagine doing this in a way where you just don't have physical access to a particular area, or maybe you're doing it in some kind of covert-ish way from the back of the vehicle, like this is a, a detector sitting in the back of the trunk looking at another vehicle. But the sort of far field case where it's um, detection, from a, detection from a distance. And then uh, just a you know, couple more examples. This is another detection from a distance. This is an example from an exercise we did um, where uh, Basically, operationally, we couldn't or weren't allowed to get any closer than this to these buildings. So trying to get as clear of a picture on where the sources are. Um, we, based on other data, we knew that there was radiation signature coming from that area somewhere, but trying to localize the source. And here, you know, dwelling on more of a, this is a little bit getting in a near field picture, trying to identify where in a particular box or create something, a specific object, getting source distribution information about a particular object of interest. And that's sort of where, you know, bringing in this product that I was mentioning, enabling 3D C scene fusion with the GEG. So we're constructing a prototype. This is what it looks like. I uh, pretty, I can now insert a photograph for this instead of here, the rendering. But this is what it uh, looks like, uh, you know, getting LIDAR and camera data, fusing that with the radiation data from the GEG so that hopefully we'll be able to generate things that look kind of like this, and we'll be able to establish uh, con ops, concepts of operation so that we can use this in the field in specific cases to uh, augment, enhance our uh, radiation localization ability. Uh, the, so it's specifically with the GG, I didn't exactly mention this, uh, Basically, a lot of money and history has been put into sort of into using HPGE detectors for localization and identification, and basically leveraging that and, and putting it with these new new sort of world and uh, 3D world contact sensors, enabling the investments that have been already made into 
uh, equipment that's already been uh, distributed to uh, the people doing the response. So our cell, RSL, Andrews and Nellis and uh, particular RAP regions already have these GEG detectors and have some operational experience with them. So we're trying to basically use that. There, it's a project to use that and enhance it to get more and get more out of that. So now, unless there are more questions on that, I'm going to change gears a little bit and talk about uh, the detection and identification that we do from our aerial platforms, uh, aerial aerial measuring system. So we have so we have basically the mission is to provide rapid um, analysis and interpretation of the of radiation data that we collect from the air. And so here showing this where aerial assets operate out of uh, picture on here this is the Las Vegas strip they operate out of Nellis Air Force Base. This is, you know, obviously Washington D.C. and Washington Monument. Uh, we operate out of Joint Base Andrews outside of Washington D.C. Um, so AMS uh, has a few different parts of it, but the one of the main is we the main parts is we maintain on call response. So we have both uh, fixed wing and uh, helicopter that are on 24 seven on call. Um, the pilots, two pilots, a mechanic, uh, a mission scientist, data analyst, home team scientist, and equipment specialist at all times at both Andrews and Nellis are on call. Um, in the case that there needs to be a rapid aerial response to some kind of radiation emergency. Um, so the typical, if it was an on-call scenario, the typical scenario would be the airplane, the fixed wing aircraft would be, res would be responding. And we all show just a second, we actually just got new aircraft. Um, delivered in November. Um, so that's exciting to us. They're a lot sleeker than the old aircraft were. Um, but um, but in, we also maintain uh, the helicopter, which um, is, is used for more detailed radiological mapping events, but it can be used in on-call response, you know, for the national capital region to specifically. We'll talk a little bit more about the mapping in just a minute. So here's here's a picture of one of our shiny new B-350 aircraft to replace. So these are fully operational now. Our old B-200s are uh, gone and sold. And were you, these are new aircraft. Very new. We acquired them basically at the end of calendar year 2019. Um, and basically, uh, it gives us a the new aircraft gave us an upgraded response capability from a just sort of response getting there mission type scenario more than a radiation detection point of view. We have the same. Uh, detect, if anyone's familiar with AMS, we have the same detectors, the same detection stand uh, scheme as we did on the old craft. Old, old fixed wing aircraft is just configured onto the new aircraft with it with improved uh,
operate successfully. Um, the workhorse for these are sodium iodide detectors. We have, uh, usually we operate with two redundant systems of three sodium iodide crystals. Um, and uh, we will sometimes carry HPGE detectors for uh, better spectral ID. And we also carry um, health physics, uh, family dose rate meter. We have a Geiger Mueller tube on board. We have also survey equipment in case of, you know, some contaminating. If we have to land and there's a contamination issue or, you know, contamination with the aircraft type issues, we have health physics equipment so that we can perform surveys if we need. But it doesn't seem like you're utilizing the space in the airplane very well. I mean, if you're going to the trouble of flying that thing, why don't you put more detectors in it? Because so, um, you, so the tip we're usually in the scenarios, this is so it's scenarios where um, we're most concerned with rapid response. The radiation detection is probably uh, relatively straightforward and we have plenty of detection volume to detect that. Um, for a nuclear power plant emergency, for instance, it's, it's a screaming hot source and you don't need a lot of detection volume to detect that. What we're really concerned more about is a rapid response in getting there um, more quickly. On the helicopters, we have it loaded with a lot more detection capability in terms of detection volume. These are more concerned with just getting detection, getting radiation detection there from the air on uh, very quickly. Um, in principle, you could load it up with more detectors, but that really doesn't, it doesn't really buy you very much more in, in terms of what we're concerned about in these, in, in basically the first mission. Still takes hours, so I have to get somewhere, like if something happens here. Right? Yeah, so it would still take hours. And so, and I, I didn't mention, so our response posture for AMS is basically um, from the time that we would get called, we'll respond within uh, so by a couple, so four hours or so. I mean, it's being more real. So it's sort of a two hour response time, but that's more in terms of like called and everything there and have it's more like four hours from a real I think from a realistic point of view but it's a we have basically our response posture is a two hour response time that means two hours to take off or two hours to two, leave. yeah two hours to leave uh, no two hours two, to take, take off, off right. yeah and then whatever. whatever time that it would take to get there so there's a B350 at each of the two sites, like the one in Nevada as well as the one you're at in DC. So there's there's always at least one of those on call in each location. We actually have more aircraft. We have we have three fixed wing aircraft. Um, uh, so there's always one at each. Typically, more often than not, there's two at Andrews and one at Nellis. But the third can kind of go between the different sites or if one down is down for maintenance or something like that. And then we also, so we have two helicopters that I'll talk more about in a minute. Um, and we generally, but not always have a helicopter on call at Andrews and the other helicopter is at Nellis. But but depending, that isn't like a hundred percent, depending on maintenance and whatnot, they can go between the different sites, but it's a lot more, it takes a lot longer to fly the helicopters between places than it does 
the fixed wing aircraft. You're not going to be fully glass battle with the helicopter. No, that's not the ones you have. Yeah. Uh, the one, yeah, the ones we have, like, it's not fun to have to travel long distance yeah. on the helicopter. Uh, you know, if we're doing something where we want to do a survey, like in the middle of the country in Kansas or Minnesota or something, there's a lot of fuel stops. <laughs> I see. Yeah. What happened when you uh, flying through plumes itself? How do you <sighs> notice that? And how do you so, that? letter of the letter of the law by policy, we don't fly in plumes. Oh, that's one nice excuse. Okay. Um, <laughs> that said, uh, we do. Um, we do have some con ops to address that and some people will give you differing opinions on if we would actually fly in a plume or not. Um, but on at least, uh, you know, programmatically, we say that we won't fly in a plume. So we, so, how do we, how do, how do we know if there is? Is that, is that you're flying or not flying? Um, we, so we do have, so there have been projects aimed at um, being better at that where you have um, up looking yes. detectors. We don't typically fly like that. Um, so what we would all, so if we were concerned about um, flying through a plume, the our concept of operation that we employ as we perform um, wind soundings, we per, we basically try to detect where the inversion layer and the atmosphere is, so that the particulates from the plume would would be would basically be staying below there um, and then we would fly above that um, so we would do everything that we could to avoid flying directly through the plume we um, operationally we are very careful and do not want to contaminate our aircraft um, it, that would possibly result in like just problems operationally if we were sure. to contaminate yeah. our, our aircraft during the uh, response. But in terms of inversion, I mean, we can talk about it. But we like, don't, like, I mean. Inversion delays on NARAC, right? right? And health protection for medical conditions and all that. Right. Which is, can be true, but right. it can be different. But the way we typically fly on board, um, we don't really have a good way of knowing if we're flying through a plume from a, like, strictly looking at the radiologically. Yeah, I, I'm already that. So here, this is uh, the helicopter system. Um, so, so the Bell 412 helicopter, you notice it's a lot slower. Um, and it can only go, you know, a few hundred miles here. So, you know, it only really fly for a few hours. There's a lot, like I was saying, there's a lot of refuel, but this is typically used for more detailed surveys. So we have uh, a total of 12 two liter sodium iodide detectors that are mounted uh, in two pods, one on each side of the aircraft. Um, and we typically fly uh, from like the mo our most typical is like 150 or 300 feet above ground level, you know, sort of 50 to 500 feet 
above ground level is our typical operating range and perform more detailed uh, radiation surveys of a particular uh, area of interest. So usually we fly and this is sort of like what just a piece of a survey area might look like. We fly in parallel lines, you know, evenly spaced parallel lines over some area of interest and then map the radiation data that we collect. So, you know, take that's just the raw thread from showing basically the GPS path that we took. And I've cut it out. There would be, so these are just the lines and then like the helicopter turns around and flies, you know, first we would hear fly north and turn around and fly south and come back north. That just cut out all the turns. And then we would uh, provide, you know, usually perform for the service spatial. This is a different survey now. Here we've done a spatial interpolation algorithm to sort of show, to fill in the gaps um, by interpolation for a picture of a map, uh, you know, a full, a full, cover a full area. This is from a flight we did over, uh, uh, this one's North, uh, sorry, Calvert Cliffs nuclear power plant. So it's a flight over, uh, nuclear power plant uh, nearby. This is in uh, in Maryland. Um, so that there I'm just showing based on the past is contaminated with cesium-137 uh, doing, these are just relative levels of cesium um, showing where the contamination is in the environment, particularly for uh, the cesium-137 here, isotope extraction. So you can imagine doing this for different isotope or mapping different metrics, but these are just kind of example data products that we uh, make for aerial measuring system. So now relatively quickly, I'd like to go through a uh, uh, couple of the people we work with at Andrews. This isn't necessarily, so it's not necessarily literally what we do, but we work with these people and it's very similar. So, and I think it gives an overall picture of response aspects that's important. The radiological assistance program basically provides some regionalized uh, radiological assistance. Uh, you've broken down into these different regions. So out here, seven, RAP region seven is operated out of Livermore. And, you know, we have these different, basically it's operated out of different national labs. Savannah River, Oak Ridge, et cetera. And they, 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 base, they provide sort of a local first response um, to, to assist tribal, local, federal, whoever it might be, agencies um, with radiation uh, detection expertise. It's sort of, they, they, they can perform some similar search um, maybe a little bit limited than what I showed for some of our 
NSP sort of federal capability, but they provide, you know, some regionalized, if a little bit um, less uh, specialized expertise. And they, they operate a lot of, they have a lot of similar detection equipment. And they, they can plug into responses in much the same way. And often by, and, and be the first ones on scene to provide uh, expertise. So when law agents, local agencies encounter, you know, lost or stolen gauges, there's sort of some of these things, there's, you know, though these gauges will be stolen or whatever, there can be a black market for them. If they encounter these, the local, they'll often work with RAP in terms of the radiation identification and that sort of thing. These are local, more regionalized response. And then the, from a CM point of view, especially talk a little bit about kind of the more overall federal response capability. That's not, that's not necessarily even just DOE, um, a lot of different government agencies can, can plug into what's called the Federal Radiological Monitoring Assessment Center or FERMAC, which is really meant for very large scale uh, radiation uh, response. So, um, and, and this can be scaled for different types of scenarios, but the general mission space is to provide technical expertise um, for radiological release or accidents to basically provide the overall response with health physics, atmospherical modeling, whatever, you know, ground or aerial measurements, air, environmental sampling, air sampling that needs to be done in order to coordinate the entire federal response for the radiological picture. And uh, we, we at RSL play uh, like certain pieces of, of the FERMAC picture. So we, we could be part of the aerial measuring system part or the, the health physics part, the, you know, more RAP would be the environmental monitoring sampling, but to a limited extent, RSL. But there's a whole lot of other pieces, NARAC doing the atmospheric modeling, uh, you know, people from Sandia providing uh, assessment support, you know, health physics, understanding how the material, understanding environmental aspects, how it impacts agriculture, and then other people being involved from, you know, USDA or, you know, or CDC or other um, local, you know, dairy crops, all these understanding how the radiation is in the environment and people need to be, if crops need to be embargoed, what decision we this is a whole big complicated picture and we're just, we just plug into these different pieces and uh, specifically where RSL plugs in, um, a large part is in the, in these sort of consequence management pieces. The, so the consequence management home team stands up at RSL uh, Nellis so it basically is uh, an operation center where they have, where, you know, they maintain a lot of expertise and coordinating for the response in terms of uh, the health physics and sampling expertise and coordinating that and keeping uh, uh, databases of, of sampling results and uh, environmental uh, sensors placed in the environment and making map products for all of these 
different, combining all the different survey results and combining all of that together. So that sort of BIRMAC response is consequence management home team will be stand, stood up and provide support throughout the, it's a, it would be a, one of the first things that would be stood up, but throughout the response would provide uh, support. But, and then early on the first thing, one of the first on scene response aspects for the firm app would be the advanced team, which is um, a team sort of deployed first just to ensure um, the successful setup of an entire firm app. The whole thing is a very complicated response that might, you know, have 50 to hundreds of people. So it's an advanced team sent ahead to uh, provide for logistics and make sure everything is set up um, so that the firm app and the full response teams can get going. And then there's the bigger, longer term, a little bit later to arrive, large scale response of consequence management, management response team that has uh, the full field support and lots of technical and mapping and resources and sampling capabilities, providing uh, sort of a larger scale full response. Okay, yeah, I'm mapping up here. Um, the, and then to give you, to give an idea of when all of this might happen. So as I mentioned, the, the home team, and ARAC, any modeling can basic can be stood up very quickly, you know, within a couple of hours, you know, immediately to within a couple of hours, depending on time it is. State and local assets such as RAP or the civil support team locally can be within a few hours, depending. And then AMS, you know, two wheel, two hours wheel off and then a couple hours to get there. Uh, the advanced consequence managed team in the sort of same timeline. And then within a matter of a day or a couple of days, you then get, start getting these uh, more longer term pictures of the uh, consequence management teams. Uh, there. Um, so to conclude, summarize everything, I talked about uh, mostly focusing on RSL specifically, but how they plug into NSA DOE's emergency RAD response picture. Uh, you know, some of the crisis response, the search that we do, and also touching a little bit but less on the consequence management uh, support that we do. The, the main functions at RSL, just to refresh, were, you know, NSP and AMS. Those are the ones I focus on. Those are the ones I most directly work on, so I can speak the most to. But the emergent, that RAD emergency response is just, uh, you know, is a bigger picture, and we operate just specific pieces of that in a larger picture. And then one last thing I'll mention, we, you know, we have, uh, we're in need of people as we always seem to be. Um, so if any, so we, this is an open job rec that we have here, but I'm at RSL Andrews, I don't know specifically about Nellis at uh, in the Vegas area, but I don't know if they have any specific ones, but generally speaking, we have open recs now, which is uh, better than our old system, where a specific one always had to be posted. But we're look, we're all we're looking for people, and we need people. So if anyone is interested specifically in this work, I'd be happy to talk to you more, or uh, you know, I can give you more details or provide whatever context or information that you might want. So. Uh, with that, I'll take any more questions, and thanks, thanks for listening. So, uh, I was curious to know, like, this might be a short conversation, but what if, what if, how do you, do you consider someone who is savvy, who has bad intent, and they have, you know, they know how to, you know, produce shielding or whatever? Mm -hmm. 
and then I want to do maybe not like a full, you know, fully critical system, but like, mm -hmm. you know, disperse rat into a stadium. Yeah, so like an R and D, yeah. Right. Like how, you know, can you have you? I, I'm sure you have, you know, like examples of how you think through all the different ways that things, you know, might go badly. You know, someone who's savvy and can show mm -hmm. something well. How, like how do you address that? Yeah, so I mean, we we certainly, I mean, we sort of we certainly think about that. We think about how you know people might mask different sources and whatnot. Uh, we have different. I mean, I mean, we look at the the data in different ways. So I mean, when we interrogate it, um, you'll we'll you'll look at interrogate the data. We kind of train our scientists to look for different things. We have in, in, in very specific, you know, in particular adjudication scenarios where we have concern about, you know, specifically SNM, we would off, we would, there's also, so at, at typically mostly, uh, there's also triage, the triage folks, which is like, a different group of people who maintain expertise, uh, you know, more specifically in SNM type threats. So in that scenario, we would, um, there are definitely times where we would activate them basically to get follow on further triage uh, support. But we also, uh, do courses and train our responders uh, for, you know, spectral identification of different signatures. Do you have your hand up? Oh, I was gonna ask these large scale events. Do you guys know how many people like essentially get medical procedures on average? Do you ever look at how effective you are? Oh, okay. after the fact, uh, based on like what your expected rate of coverage should be. Um, I'm not aware of us having looked at, you know, what fraction of people we might expect to have encountered that actually had the medical. I'm not aware of us having calculated something like that, but that would be that would be interesting. Yeah, to help you with uh, figuring out how uh, what, often you're missing sources. Yeah, how effective your coverage is for sure. Yeah. Which I really don't know at the moment. Like, most <laughs> yeah. Negatives, right? yeah. Which is a major concern. <laughs> you don't have to cover it uh, There's like the yeah. UDM work that might help with that. Yes. I mean, certainly we have, like, I mean, yeah. There's, there's, other, questions. there's modeling work that Ren and Nico do. Because I mean, one is, of course, how much do you miss, and you want to know how many you actually miss. Yeah. I think that was, I mean, you yeah. want to know that. I mean, ultimately, you want to have other means of access and access to this information. Then the other, the other challenge is masking. Mm -hmm. Like, if you have medical patients, say, oh, that's medical patient, but is that all you have? Yeah. So that certainly should be a concern, too. Yeah. It's all related to that question that, I mean, you have a lot of information out there, you should make use of it. Yeah. In terms of both positive and false negatives, but false negatives is actually two ways. Yes. Yeah. That's why I'm asking. Sure. More general question is just kind of based on that. Do you uh, optimize, like numerically or in any way, um, the deployment or the particular mission before you go out? Do you just do any tools or if you know if you're given scenario just say, okay, um, this is the optimum for this scenario or is you, it just our so for you not usually for uh, uh for like a big uh, for like a large scale uh event. No, not you no. Uh we sort of have standard we just sort of use our suite of detection algorithms and you you know have a thr you have different thresholds for alarms based on you know what 
false alarm rate you're willing to accept and such. Um, if we were in a more tactical scenario, working with law enforcement, like looking for a particular source, we may look at a different metric that might not be looking at, that might not be what you would be more typically using in the like larger, uh, the larger PR and D scenarios. So in those situations, yeah, we might do something uh, more specialized and you might, you know, look at a particular, something more sensitive to a particular isotope or a type of neutron detection or something. But we, we don't, we wouldn't usually, we would only usually do that if you had uh, like a targeted source of interest, not for a, not for like a general preventative rad new type case. Just finally, I guess, to your last point, uh -huh. we are here on the university for, on, on purpose. So we were aware that you actually, there's a there's need, I don't know. New, new people. Yeah. So I mean, for our students, uh, because we do certainly have students from undergraduates. I mean, we have uh, massive engineering mm -hmm. program students and PhD students. Because you showed an example of just senior scientists, which I apply that's like PhDs, like you are. Yeah. But in terms of opportunities so, for our students, what levels? Is so okay, levels? Yeah. So actually, so th this what I'm showing here. Senior scientists. This could be masters or PhD. This wouldn't okay. this wouldn't necessarily uh, require PhD. So in so see so senior principles kind of like a different level of experience. So what I'm showing here could essentially apply for anything from masters to postdoc or be like staff or beyond or whatever depending on your experience. Right, so we also do, so for un, uh, undergrad students, we have uh, internships for summers, um, or uh, we or um, even mm -hmm. undergraduate level degrees as well. Right, again, the job opportunities That's right, for yeah. bachelors. That's right. For you have that too, mm -hmm. in principle. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you will be a point of contact for that? Yeah, sure, I mean, Anyone who's anyone who is interested in working, you know, in here or at Nellis, I'd be happy to, you know, forward on resumes or connect with whoever's the necessary people, be it like, you know, at us directly at RSL Andrews or our colleagues at Nellis. Or I'd be happy to connect people with whoever the necessary person is. Right. Because we have still have NSC and NSC and Mingo, there are actually quite a few people yeah. that are doing not necessarily right now and this summer and early really next. Oh, summer. yeah, so for sure. Yeah. Really probably put people looking for jobs. Mm -hmm. Thanks, General yeah. Yeah. yeah, you have those. Um, um, right. Okay, yeah. Good. Every now and then I'll. Yeah, make sure you keep us a little. Yeah. Or the local brother. Thanks, Scott, again. All right. So, what are the new helicopters? Is this still the Bella? Some kind there of. There we. So, they're. I, the,